you're listening in, there was a little gem that he just dropped, but rewind and listen again. Would you go residential property or commercial? We're basically a residential agent and agency and we've invested into more residential property. But I think with that, if I said to you, the commercial properties that we've able to acquire, there are a lot less headaches, but the return is... What is your favorite all-time investment property strategy? Don't procrastinate. If there's an opportunity, back yourself. Brokers, and as you know, and uh, financiers, you've got a pretty good read from a good broker or a good banker, and they'll give you an idea that you can do it. And don't be the one that you look back and say, what would you say to someone who wants to start investing in property, but they don't have enough income or money? Respectfully, I'm not judging anybody here, but... I absolutely love that. You look at some of the other countries and hustle is real. Like you look at Asia, not, not even Asia, you look at America. The side hustle or the gig economy is massive. And the thing that I hear from you is... The information provided in this podcast is for general purposes only and should not be considered personal advice. Always consult with qualified professionals or experts in the relevant field for personalized advice tailored to your specific situation. Welcome back to Catching Up With Property. In this episode, we've got our special guest, OG, David Rees, real estate agent from Jim Macon and Partners. He's going to unpack everything in the real estate space. Thanks for having me, Scott. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and um, yeah, we welcome um, all these wonderful questions you're going to get to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> we do appreciate the years of intelligence. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's intelligence, but anyway, we'll see how we go. Thank you. So I thought we'll probably start this session with a bit of a backstory because for those who have been listening, they know that I've been talking about my Penrith property, my journey there, the hopes of building a townhouse there. If you're sitting there listening to his podcast or watching it and you're wondering who David Reeves is, there's a little segment in one of the episodes where I talk about a real estate agent who takes me around all of Penrith. So this is he, David Reeves. David, you I don't I'm not sure if you actually remember, but back in the day when I wanted to build that townhouse, you actually uh, was very generous with your time. You took me in your car and you drove me around all of Penrith and you were literally just pointing out that house sold for this and you're like, that house has a DA on it. That one's building three townhouses. If you combine that one, that one, you can get six. And you spend about an hour and a half driving around all of Penrith, just pointing out where all the potential development sites were. Mm. Mm. I hope I did the right thing, mate, because you did, you have invested in it a long time ago, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, I it hasn't sort of quite broken ground yet, has it? Know, but anyway, so... It? Yes, that was back in the day when it was terrific. You got to have people in uh, in the second office, which was the car, and you're able to sort of express our, I suppose, our passion for the area and for development and for for the city of Penrith and what it has to offer. And a lot of those things have have come to fruition, and and there's obviously a wonderful future ahead. But I think you, as you know, you've got a great property there, but these things take a lot of time, don't they? And yeah, a lot of time, a lot of effort, and there's a lot of red tape to go with all that, isn't there? So mm. a lot of red tape. So if you've been listening, you'd know that I submitted my DA and the council changed the frontage yes. and ripped it out <laughs> after three years of working on that. <laughs> yes. yes, it's okay. The missing middle piece might come back. Yeah. Well, you're still talking to me, so that's good. At least, uh, yeah, there's no money back guarantees, is there, unfortunately, in property uh, development? But anyway, I do remember all, all that time ago, we uh, we got to sort of have a bit of a look around and, yeah, and, and that was one of the great things about, let's call it the older days of real estate where you got to spend a lot of time with clients and you got to appreciate each other's company and where you were coming from and hopefully have that common goal where we were able to help facilitate what you were trying to do. So, yes, but that's a few years ago now isn't it yeah. a few years yes few yes. few few years <laughs> i was had a lot more brown hair then too i would suggest but anyway <laughs> my whites are starting to show okay yeah fair enough so i thought maybe to kick off this session we'll do a little game it's called rapid fire where you pick one or the other and tell us the reason why yep are you ready oh, i'm ready would you flip or hold a property hold and why long-term growth passive income then you don't have to give the government any more stamp duty after you've done it once oh yeah. i like that yeah capital growth or 
cash flow. This is pointed. Uh, you need cash flow for capital growth. Is that a, is that a cop out? Uh, I'm a great believer in holding property, so probably um, capital growth will probably win. But yeah, you do need cash flow to get the capital growth. So I don't know. That's probably a bit political. I'm a bit on the fence there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll say capital yeah. growth. <laughs> yeah, capital growth. Yeah, yeah. And lastly, would you go residential property or commercial? We're basically a residential agent and uh, agency, and uh, we've invested into more residential property but I think with with that if I said to you the commercial properties that we've um, able to acquire there are a lot less headaches yeah well probably more less headaches but the return is is usually fairly good if you do your homework so I think commercials it's easier but there's lots of fun with res- residential so I'm probably gonna still continue to do residential as much as commercial anyway so beautiful Dave, how long have you been a real estate agent? Yeah, 27 years. 27 this year. years. So we, we broke 27 years yeah, this year. So it's been a long journey. Good journey, but a long journey. Still going. Still going. Yeah. Still turn up every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it true real estate agents must pass on every offer to the vendor to consider? Yeah, technically you you should. There is, let's call it the legalistic view is that a client has to put a, an initial deposit down for all offers to be informed to a seller. But these days, most people don't worry about that. Good agents will always inform vendors of all offers anyway. We ask for things in writing anyway. So these days you've got a much better paper trail to do it. And um, no matter how those offers look, I always tell our sellers, just be ready. I'll inform you of all offers. They're not always going to be pretty. If you're from my culture, you'd lowball them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Every, so I've dealt with you, Scott. I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything's uh, negotiable. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, used to that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all fine. I wanted to pick your brain. In the city market, a lot of properties go for auction now. What are some auction tips or strategy to win an auction? From a purchaser's point of view, look, I think my feelings are in our area, we primarily don't do a lot of auctions, but I have run quite a few over the years. I always say to my clients, be bold, just get out there and and let the opposition know that you're around. If it's strong, well, just go your hardest until there is that line in the sand. I do say to people, just respectfully do that line in the sand. You've got to say to each other, particularly if it's a partner, you know, there's partners buying together and whatnot, just know that there is a limit. You know what your limit is and you know what your scary limit is. Don't go past the scary limit. And if it's meant to happen, it'll happen. There's always another property. I love that. I've never heard of the limit and then the scary limit. (laughs) So make sure you have two limits. Don't go past that scary limit. Go strong right at the beginning. Scare the opposition. If you don't get it, there's always another property. Absolutely. Which might be better. Absolutely. And what's meant to happen will happen. I love that. You're in real estate yourself, but I mean, it's fair to assume you invest in property yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Can you share some of the things you've done in your time in terms of property investment? That journey started a long time ago for me. My business partner that we um, started the business together with himself and members of his family, he introduced me to property development before we actually became real estate agents and started off with doing a duplex and it was mainly residential based. Then we progressed and did a couple of little subdivisions and got in. And as we built our business, we were able to buy some commercial property to build some commercial properties, which now house some of the businesses we run. They're our buildings. So we were able to do those. So some we acquired, some we built. Yeah, just different things that have come up. We've always just tried to be careful because there's developers in our area that you can't have your your feet in both camps, shall I say. But sometimes there's been opportunities where properties have come up and we've found ourselves in a position where we been able to do things. So a mixture of residential development, some a bit of commercial development, and where possible, we've tried to hang and hold some of those properties and uh, like to do what the Greeks do and try to hang on to what we can. It was an old Greek friend of mine always said, don't sell anything, but I haven't been able to be as good as that. But we, we have hung on to some properties and, and that obviously holds you in good stead for for some passive income and hopefully those properties, you know, get some capital growth. So yeah, we've had a mixture of that and, and look forward to what the future holds for hopefully some more stuff, yeah. Wow, that's a, that's a really juicy. I didn't realize you guys were doing commercial developments as well. Yeah, just a bit like just small stuff, more stuff that is related to our business. There was 
some opportunities where some, you know, retail shops and things have come up. And yeah, so just some opportunities have found us. And I, I find that in real estate that sometimes you think you're the one that finds the opportunities, but sometimes those opportunities find you. They just land in your lap. Yeah. And you never know how these things work out. So some things have worked out well. And I wouldn't say every transaction we've made has been successful, but that's how you learn too. So if you don't try, you'll never know. And in your opinion, what is your favorite all-time investment property strategy? Buy young enough, live long enough. (laughs) 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 That helps. I think definitely don't procrastinate. If there's an opportunity, back yourself. Brokers and as you know, and uh, financiers, most of the time, You've got a pretty good read from a good broker or a good banker and they'll give you an idea that you can do it and don't be the one that you look back and say, well, you know, why didn't I do that? Just don't procrastinate. If it feels right, if your gut's telling you go for it, go for it and you'll find a way to get to make it happen. Yeah. Good brokers are invaluable, aren't they, Scott? So. <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, that's my advice. Don't hesitate. Life's too short for hesitations. So don't procrastinate and just go for it. In your opinion, what makes a good and solid property investment? Yeah, look, it's got to be something if it's residential, commercial or the same. It's got to be somewhere where people want to be, you know, in the sense of geographically, I always sort of look and say, well, what's happening in that area from an infrastructure point of view? Do you have services that are close by, particularly in residential people? I think they want to basically have access to good services. So as you know, be close as close to the action as you can. I think no, is it a, I always sort of say to people from a residential point of view, if I was buying something, is this somewhere I could live? People say you shouldn't get emotional with with investment properties, but I think you you know respectfully, I look at the people that are leasing some of our properties, and you know I'm happy to live in those properties because I make sure they're well maintained, they're in good areas. I never have vacancies because of that. So I think it's I think it's knowing could I run a business out of there? Could I live there? I think that's imperative, and then it will serve you well. And you know obviously you're always looking at returns and yields on your investment, and you want to see that. Capital growth goes well. But if I look at the Sydney metro area, which is where primarily we're based and you're based, geez, you've just got to back it, haven't you? It's got a proven track record and it will just continue to grow. A wonderful city. COVID proved to us all that the rest of the world wants to live here. So if that's the case, I think just continue to invest in the Sydney metro area. You're generally going to be pretty fine. Yeah, fair call. So look at what the development's happening in the area. Yeah. Make sure you're maintaining your investment properties. Mm, Yes. And if you had to live in it, you'd live in it. You're not buying a dump and renting out a dump. Nobody wants to live in something like that. No. And know that if I look at people that are leasing through us and I sort of suggest that we're all people in the end and I want to make sure that if people are leasing through us, you know, from a tenancy point of view, that they know we're humane and we want to make sure that they've got a property that's well cared for. We're not going to skimp on things. And then I think you will get that loyalty back from most people. Most people do the right thing by people who do the right thing by them. So I think it's a good philosophy. I love that. Being human centric. Now, in your past, is there a property investment you wish you had executed differently? And can you share this story and some of the lessons you learned? Yeah, I, I would suggest that not every property that I've been involved in has been has been great transaction. I hope my wife doesn't see this um, because <laughs> she can remind me of the ones that probably haven't done that well on it. And, you know, and that's life. There was a property that we bought, two of us bought. We bought the property... It was a DA approved unit complex. This was quite a few years ago. I thought I knew about unit development. We hung on to this property, it was back, let's call it, was probably in that sort of after the 2003 where things started to peter off. And there was about eight to 10 years, or probably in our area, about eight to 10 years where there was very little growth. We were paying big interest payments on this property. So at this time, yeah. did you develop it already? Or? It was already had a DA on it and we wanted to change the development application, increase the units. And I was out of my depth at that stage and I learned the hard way that we paid the interest on this property and we, we maintained, well, we kept this property for, I think it was about for seven or eight years and we carried it. And I think I felt like I knew more about what I could do. And a valuable lesson is that you should work out when are you 
when you're out of your depth. And I think in that case, we learned from that. Yeah, got some great, great tax deductions, but that's not really what it's about as far as losses are concerned. But the lessons that I learned out of that were invaluable. And I, I'm glad I had the experience because it, it taught me that do some better research next time, make sure you don't get caught out. And also, I think I didn't back myself because I probably didn't have the confidence that I knew enough about that line of development. But I've since learned and would now back myself in that same situation and play the long game. And we would have come out of it all right. So the lesson was invaluable. And once again, I'm, I'm glad I did it. There's no regrets because I don't believe in regrets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mm. No regrets, yeah. no surrender. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this development, it was a unit development that had a DA already. Yes. And then you acquired it. You were hoping to maybe upgrade the DA yeah, yeah, to get yeah. like maybe a, a, high yield. Yeah. a few more units on top. Mm. And then you had holding costs during that time because you were trying to get the extra units. You couldn't materialize it. Yeah. And I learned a valuable lesson that in the planning process that they've got all the time in the world because it's not the their money. They're not worried about our situation. And once again, that taught me a valuable lesson that, yeah, okay, not everybody's going to see your vision. And if they don't have to help you in a lot of those cases, they don't. Mm. They just follow a process. So I learned that lesson that I would not get caught out again. And I'll make sure I've got good planners, good consultants, good architects, have good people around you because you, you're only as good as the people around you and have a good team with you. And yeah, that, so that was invaluable for me. And unfortunately, you had to let that one go at a yeah, loss. Let that one go. If you had kept it, would you have made a loss? The long game again. I would have justified myself that I didn't lose because the capital growth would have oh. would have been able to do it. One of the good things out of it, I met some good people, I met some good builders, and I met some good contacts out of it that we've since um, been able to do real estate transactions with them. And they've also been very helpful for me with some of the developing that we've done that, you know, there's been some good contacts come out of that. Oh, that's good. That's invaluable. Absolutely. Money can't buy that. No, not at all. Good relationships. And that's brought you into your next development and your next yes. development. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Get a good so team around you. Real, real estate agents lose money too, you know. We, <laughs> we think we know, but sometimes we don't see things happening. So, yeah. Anyway, it was a great lesson. And in your opinion, how many properties do you think someone need to replace an average household income or an average income yeah. in Sydney? It's a pretty loaded question, that one. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's fine. <laughs> I think I'll say this respectfully, depending on the, and I'm talking about maybe the husband's in the room and they might have a wife that's a good spender. So depending on what that income will be or whether you've got some daughters that, you know, might be very good on the spending uh, side of things and try to keep you poor. iPads, yeah, LVs, yeah, All that Chanel. sort of stuff. Yeah. Just depends, jewellery. But if you if you look at it all, I think it comes down to the fact, what does somebody, like, can you live on 100000 a year? Can you live on 200000 a year? Do you need 500000 or a million dollars a year? I, look, I think it's working out what do you feel, what sort of lifestyle do you want? What can you do? My dear old dad, who was an old banker, mind, mind you, Scott. Yeah, yeah, old banker back in the old- Which bank? Day. Well, it was actually originally the CBC Bank, which then merged with the NAB. Ah, oh, right. And I remember his philosophy he used to say to me, and this, these words have been used before, but he said, it's not so much how much you earn, it's how much you save. How much you um, keep, yeah. And I think this is the thing, it works out. So I would be looking and saying, well, if you're saying for argument's sake, I'm living on 150000 a year or 200000 a year, this is what I need, then look at it all, but weigh it up and work on a net value because – the lovely government have this beautiful thing called land tax now. They have these wonderful hidden taxes. So I think work out, make sure that all your outgoings are covered when you are looking at it because it's the hidden outgoings that often people forget. And guess what? They keep coming quite regularly. Land taxes is that annual thing that I shut up when I see. And that's just one thing. So I think think about that, but think about the net figure you need to be able to allow you to live the lifestyle you want. And I think that's a real mark of, um, I think anybody gets in that position, that then gives you options on how you want to live your life. And I think it's a wonderful achievement. People talk about retirement. I say that if you can get to a situation where you've got a passive income that allows you to have a lifestyle that you want, well, the rest of it's just all a game after that. Yeah, 100%. I absolutely agree. The old saying, I don't know if it's still true anymore. And I think in my years I heard it, it was like, uh, by retirement, you want to have at least 
four or five properties paid off yep. by retirement. And then you could just live on the income stream on that. Yep. But you're saying watch out for land tax. <laughs> watch out for land tax. And just watch out for the hidden costs because land tax wasn't there. Uh, well, 20 it's, years it's, ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are uh, the federal government, state government, and local government going to tax us respectfully? I'm not very trusting of what they are doing and what they are needing, where they are needing to source their income yeah. from. And often they will go for the property owners. Go for the property it's a, owners. It's a massive cash stream for them. And I find it very hard to trust that they're not going to find more ways to tax people because they're not very good spenders of our money, unfortunately. Managers. Uh, no. no. Manage of our money. That's right. Maybe yes. <laughs> anyway, I'm taking I'm taking Kerry Packer's phrase on that, but I totally agree that they reluctantly are not are not always good managers of our money. That's yeah, that's correct. Yeah, fair. Mm. It's if it's not property, it's going to be something else. Yes. What would you say to someone who hasn't bought a property and wanting to build a portfolio? Person who really wants to start their uh, property investment journey, but they haven't bought their first property. What would you okay. say to them? Yep. I would suggest, and this was part of my journey when we bought the first properties for myself and when I met my now wife, what we worked out at a young age was, or young, fairly young age at the time, work really hard to get the deposit, save hard, go through the sacrifices, get your deposit. You don't have to live in that property. In fact, I would suggest where you don't have to live in that property, don't live in that property. Grab the deductions that come with that because you can be renting something else if you've got a partner or whatnot or you want to you're not going to be living at home, depending on your age. If you did that, then the deductions will help carry a lot of those ongoing costs. And this was evident for us when we accumulated our first sort of couple of properties. We never lived in those and they worked for us and that allowed us then to decide so what property you, we were going to get. You in. were a rent fester? I rented. I rent, my wife and I, when we first got married, we rented for five years. Mind you, it was in a property that my business partner and my dad, they built some villas. The good thing is down the track, I was able to buy a couple of those villas back off my mum and dad. So it was nice. So eventually we got to own those. But at the time, the deductions far outweighed for us to own or to live in a property and not use that income to the advantage. So that's a short way of getting or a quicker way of getting to where you need to get to. Yeah, wow. I feel better about myself. I'm a rent investor too. <laughs> hey, it's making the, the money you earn and the tax that we give away that the government has to give us some of that back when you use the deduction. So anyway, that's a small philosophy that worked for me and I've been able to advise um, lots of people over the years to, to think about doing that. Mm. Yeah, wow. Amazing. Mm. What would you say to someone who wants to start investing in property, but they don't have enough income or money? I think in this country, you've got the capacity. Depend I know everybody's situations differently and depending on what they do, but if you really want to work hard and you want to sacrifice, make sacrifices, you can get the deposit. It's how much you want it. I know some people that say, I'm working hard, but what's working hard? Respectfully, I'm not judging anybody here, but you know, is it working 35 to 40 hours and, and that's it? If you were earning a second or a third income doing stuff and, it, and you're just trying to get that first bit of your deposit, in this country, there are lots of ways to earn extra income. I love that. I absolutely love that. You look at some of the other countries and hustle is real. <laughs> Yeah. You know, like you look at Asia, not, not even Asia, you look at America, like the side hustle or the gig economy is massive. Yes. You know, yes. everyone is a Lyft driver or an Uber driver in their spare time. Yes. Earning, you know, spare change. Everybody's doing multiple things over there. But yeah, absolutely. I hear. And the thing that I hear from you is sacrifices. I don't think our generation knows what sacrifice is. <laughs> No, well, it is interesting, and um, you know, everybody's got their own story. But I think one of the things is that the example we've always tried to teach our children is is that is that old saying: the harder you work, the luckier you get. But it is the fact if you're making the sacrifices, and that's something that you really want. I mean, look at respectfully, look at Olympians, you know, and what they do just to get where they want to get to. If you want to become a homeowner in this country, respectfully, you can get there. People say it's harder than our day. There's arguments for or against that. I get it but we're still in a wonderful country that allows you to do things. I use an example, a young guy that's just bought a property from me. The guy's 21. He's doing an apprenticeship and on Saturdays he does lawns in the good times, and I'm talking about the summer times, he earns between $500 and $1,000 on a Saturday. Oh, nice. Now, 
that is chunk change. It's a lot of lawns, but I'm just saying that's because, and that's allowed him to get a deposit on the house. Please, I'm not being meant to be judgmental here when I say this. Everybody's got a story and everybody's got a capacity, but if you really want something, then most of the time we can find a way. Yeah, absolutely. Now, let's shine the light back into your area. So, what has the Penrith and Lower Mountains market, which is the market you serve, experienced in the last 12 months? So the last 12 months has been, it's been okay. Uh, We haven't seen a huge amount of growth. It's been a steady market. The properties that have been selling 2023 and 2024 are not dissimilar. The numbers are fairly, fairly much the same. I wouldn't say it's the highest turnover years that we've seen in property, but it's been okay. And I think that lack of stock has helped keep prices up there. Obviously, with the interest rate rises, that does put a little bit of a dip, but it's not been as big a dip as we would have thought. I've seen much harder times in real estate as far as seeing things dip. I think it's been fairly steady. I think, um, yeah, sorry, 2022 and two, going back to 2023. So the last two years have been that way. 2024, you were sort of wondering, where does that head, Scott? Yeah. I think it's going to be, once again, a pretty steady year. I think that, I don't think there's too many more in interest rate rises left. I don't have direct access to the RBA governor, but as- uh, Neither you, do you, I. You, you know, neither <laughs> Scott. Uh, so she's obviously got a job to do, but I think that there's not too many more left. I think we'll come out of that. What I'm really excited about for is in our areas, 2025, 2026, we've got this great conversation to talk about the second Sydney airport, which has just been a huge, huge thing for our area to, shall I say, lean on. And we're looking forward to what that you know, may bring from an economic point of view in the area. I understand some people may not like it, but I think for the whole, I think a lot of people are very um, excited about what that will do for our area. Yeah, 2024, I think, is still going to be fairly steady. And I think the building, we can't keep up with the demand. I mean, I think we just look at immigration. We haven't got enough housing to go around. So I think established homes are going to do well. I think apartments will pick back up. If we can cut out the red tape and make bureaucracy a little bit leaner, that, that would be fantastic because not every developer you think is out there as a greedy person. They do want to deliver good products. They want to deliver good housing to people. I see more good developers out there than you know greed oriented people. I think you know they've got to make a profit, but I think they want to deliver good products. So that's the people I deal with anyway. I'm staying close with you. <laughs> <laughs> so you reckon 2024 is just gonna like kind of hover along? What do you think is going in 2025 and 2026? That's gonna like tick. Yeah, it'll catch up. We just won't have enough stock. I don't believe. I don't think we're uh, catching up quick enough. I think that the rollover from immigration will not be able to catch up with the demand. I think the uh, supply and demand. There won't be enough supply for the demand, in my opinion. So you reckon it's tough now, but it's going to be tougher in 2025? I think so because the immigration's not stopping. Yeah, you know, this country. We, we, we need him. It. We need it. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing. So it's been part of the fabric of this wonderful country. It's the best country in the world. People want to be here. So I think it's just a, it's phenomenal that we know that's where, where it can happen. We just got to all band together, and that's bureaucracy, that's government, that's consumers, builders, community. developers, community. We tie in together. This will be better. But and I'd like nothing more. You know, we've got kids that are that are um, getting into the housing market. So love to see. So there's incentives there. But that could be a government thing where you're giving some. You know, back in the day, people were giving a ten thousand dollar buy grant and a yeah. and no stamp duty or whatever. You know, let's allow some of those things to, maybe to come back to give some incentive to some of those first home buyers. I think that's as a country, I think we've got a bit of a responsibility to to help people get a leg up. And I think people may argue that point, but I think there's some really good merit in in seeing the next generation. And I, what I do know is that when people own something, you know, they become proud. They want to be a part of a community. So you know, it's a bit of identity, are. isn't it? It is, yeah. And that's what we are as Australians. You know, it's a big part of us. So, so if you're listening in, there was a little gem that he just dropped, but rewind and listen again. <laughs> <laughs> What's your top tip you would give your 20-year-old self? Yeah, back yourself. There's lots of brilliant people in this world and they're brilliant at what they do. Respectfully, you don't have to be the most brilliant person. You don't have to have all the knowledge You don't have to be an expert. You just need to get up and make the bed, brush your teeth and get out and have a go. Take action. Yeah. I love that. And I love that story about your client, the 21-year-old who did the side hustle and was mowing lawns to collect his deposit. I don't hear that very often these days, Mm. but I think back in the day, you used to hear it a lot. 
Yeah. But I really, really love that story. Coming towards the end, any last message you want to tell the audience or any last messages you want to share? I think just that we're very blessed in this country. We're blessed. I think COVID taught us a lot that this wonderful country people want to come and live in. Let's appreciate what we've got as a country moving forward. Be a part of a community that, because if you give as a community, our business has always been very much, you know, give back to the community that supports you. I think in life we can do it. And I think about some of the property transactions and some things and, you know, that just didn't happen. That journey for me started almost 40 years ago. It's a long game, but it's a good game and you're going to make some mistakes. You're not always going to get it right. But I think you'll look back and at least if you know you tried and in this country, you can do anything you want to do. So I'm really passionate about the next generation. I think the next generation's got so much going for them. I think they're so much better than sometimes our generation and older generations give them credit for because I see some wonderful young human beings within our organisation and come across it and just there's lots to be excited about in this country. So let's be an optimistic country, not a pessimistic country. There's so much to look forward to. So and count our blessings. We are blessed and don't know if I can say much more than that, but yeah. I love that. Have gratitude for what you have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for listening to this episode of Catching Up With Property. I hope you've enjoyed listening listening to lessons from OG real estate agent, David Reeves. And if people are wanting to follow you or connect with you, where can they find you? Yeah, so our business is called Jim Aiken and Partners Real Estate. We're based in the Penrith Lower Mountains area. If you Google our website, you'll see my rough head there and our details. But we've got a great team of agents in the selling side of it, the property management. Obviously, we'd love to send you out there. Love what's happening in the Penrith Lower Mountains area. And we're really excited. Put it this way, we may not have a beach, but we're just about got everything else out there now. So uh, I did see that article. Yeah, you saw the article. Yeah, so. So it's apparently it's a we call it a beach but anyway it's the western version of a beach but i think we've got an indoor skiing facility that's looking to get built so we're just about going to have everything out there that bondi parents. doesn't have yeah that's <laughs> right yeah that's right yeah we we can't compete with bondi beach but we're having a crack out there in the good old west and i know it might be a little bit warmer and all those sorts of things but there's lots of good people out there and and it's wonderful to see what's happening in our town and the lower mountains is just a gorgeous gorgeous part of the world come out and experience it it's not that big a drive you're not going to um not be able to get back home it's a lovely place to live amazing so when you got spe- some spare time over the summer make sure you head out to penrith and enjoy the penrith beach <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right uh thanks so much for listening to catching up with property catch you in the next episode bye mm-hmm.